Have you ever wondered how, if you can just look at a solution of some kind of sweet solution and determine how sweet it is, how much sugar there is in there? Uh, of course, you have your tongue, and that's a great sensory sort of instrument to determine how sweet something is. But, but can we use our eyes? Well, let's take a look in using a polarimeter, using special properties of light to determine how a special molecule, sucrose, is detectable based on its concentration. Well, welcome, and, and I want to introduce to you the sort of techniques that you can use with a polarimeter to determine concentrations of chiral molecules. Chiral molecules have a center of which there is a left and right-handedness um, as you look at them, as you can't put a right-handed glove on your left hand, uh, for instance, so is a chiral molecule. If you have one orientation of uh, the molecule that have the same properties, almost to the extent um, of all physical properties, but light interacts with those still in a little different way. Now, what is it about light that can detect those molecules where most other substances like melting point or solubility or other, you know, other properties of that substance don't change much? And that is the nature of how light travels. Light, typically a single photon, will come towards you as a single beam and it will vary in electric intensity or in magnetic field in a certain plane. Now, if you have a bunch of light, there's all sorts of waves where those are coming through, but your sunglasses have sort of a screen on those. And think of a picket fence like this, and only the light that's vibrating in a certain plane makes it through. If it's going this way, it gets cut out. That's what stops the glare off a flat surface like a lake or a mountain snow or something. And it can keep you seeing in those situations. It blocks out that other light that's reflected off flat surfaces. Now, how can we use that though to determine how sweet a solution is just by the way it looks? We're going to take this polarimeter cell, which has a certain sort of bulb in here. You know, we put solutions into this cell. Uh, but if you leave a little bubble, you can sort of tip it so that the bubble comes into the cell. This is a water solution. It's water, not solution. But um, I'm going to put that in first so we know where light is just normally without having to worry about having other molecules in there. I'm going to put it in and so that I'm going to take up many variables out of the way as I can. You might notice I'll put, for instance, the label that's on there in one certain direction, always up. I'm going to kind of push this as far to one direction as I can. I'm also going to make sure that the bulb is in one direction more to the right for me, but that's just whatever your sort of normal, um, you choose what your lab procedure should be, but stick with that and that eliminates some of the variables. It's sort of a tricky process enough so that you want to make sure only thing that's changing is the concentration inside that solution in this cell. I'm going to go ahead and turn that down just so that we don't have stray light coming in from some other source. Um, you'll notice I marked the polarimeter with a place on, there's, a, there's actually a little notch on here to sort of tell you, relative if you're sort of spinning this dial. And what you're doing is you're spinning the set, sort of the second cross polarizer. You're spinning that until you get to a place where the light coming through is maximized. So if your gate is like this and the molecules are vibrating in a plane and they turn somehow and they're now vibrating in a different one, you want to turn that cross polarimeter until they get a maximum and you'll know that's how much the light has turned one way or the other. So let's show you how that works. I've marked this just so you can see it, but well, let me turn this on. You'll see I'm starting really close to the axis and that's just when you turn this on, that's going to be determining where the axis is. So could be in any position, but um, ideally you're going to start there. And if I start to push this forward, notice that there's a peak and down at the bottom there's a minimum. Now we're at that minimum. Here's where the polarizer on this side is like that. The polarizer on this side is like this, so that any light making it through this one does not make it through the second one. And I'll keep rotating through. There's a maximum. The light through the first one is making it through the second one. And I'll just go all the way until I've rotated one time through or 360 degrees. And I can see on the rolling sort of wheel itself, I'll rotate just a little past the starting position. All right, that's the data I need. Let's go ahead and stop this collection. And if I want to find out one of the places anywhere in this, you know, it looks like a wave, anywhere on the sine curve, I just need to measure the same piece from one solution to the next. So usually we would say in the directions to find the first full peak past the starting place. This is not quite a full peak, this one right here, even though it's the first peak. We're going to go to the second one, which is the first full peak. And we're going to use the tools available to us to find out what that peak value is. Now, I could put the coordinate tool on there and sort of go back and forth until I find out which one's highest. 
it's more easily found using the line fit tool. So I'm going to select a region of this graph, maybe the top third, top half, so you have a good selection of that peak. I'm going to use the tool, the curve fit tool, which is either down in the toolbar at the bottom, or if you click on that, that area of selection and go to the last choice, so that you would say, let's put a Gaussian fit. You'll recognize Gaussian as the bell curve, sort of a standard distribution. And what's cool about the, the formula that comes up in this one, the letter C, the term C, is the center of that distribution, which is the peak of that wave. So you don't have to sit there and take the tedious detail to find that peak. We're going to use it as 187. Now, in the second page of this experiment, you're going to put those numbers in there. Notice the tops here. This shows whatever the concentration of this is, which, of course, for water is zero. We have no sugar in there. The second one says, what's the maximum that this shows up at? And we saw it was 187. And then the last one was the optical rotation, or the difference from the maximum of just water. And of course, there's no difference. This is water, so there's right. it's the same value as the maximum that just water has. Let's go on to a second run. We'll take our next solution, which is 3%. Again, we're going to orient the bulb so that it's one direction. We'll put the sort of manufacturer's label on the top, so we minimize sort of the differences between these. Most of the labs are going to be written so you use one cell. So you're using the same cell, you'll keep it all oriented. Move that uh, cell one direction so it's fit the same way it always is. Make sure your wheel is in about the right place, a little ahead of where you started. And let's run the second solution of 3% sucrose. And notice I must have moved the wheel a little bit. Don't get worried about that because you will see I'm just going to rotate it back. And even if I had started here, which is a little bit further ahead than the mark. If I rotate it the other way, you're going to notice, as long as I do it sort of evenly and not too fast, that you're going to get the same set of data. So don't worry if you, you, get, you, know, you start closer to 360 than you do at zero degrees, but that way you'll get a nice collection of a full circle of that wheel. Go ahead and stop, and let's figure out where that peak is here on this run two. Using the select tool, I'm going to get an isometric amount of that peak. If you think you missed it, maybe move it so that you get the whole peak like I just did. I grabbed the whole box and moved it. Let's put the Gaussian fit on here and say OK. And this one now has a peak at 189. The C term in the Gaussian fit shows the center of distribution. And we're going to put in 189 in the maximum for this 3% solution. We do know the concentration now. 3% means 3 grams per 100 mils. That's sort of the way they do these. I put 3 grams into a 100 mil volumetric flask, and that means 3 out of 100, or 3%. Notice these, though, say grams per mil. So that is a good point, and I have entered this in incorrectly. So 3 out of 100 in terms of percent is 0 0.03. Normally, these are represented as grams per mil, not grams per 100, so it's 100 times smaller. All right, what's the difference between the minimum transmission and this one? It's two degrees. We are two degrees larger because there's sugar in there. So we're going to map that out by putting a two. And our first point is mapped. Actually, our second point. Zero is a valid point as well. Now we're going to put a new solution in. And that's going to be 6% solution. I'll orient this the same way. Put the label at the top. Scooch the cell over to the right. Make sure this is a little ahead of the starting reading. And let's make a second run. I must have moved it just far enough ahead, so it's closer to the zero axis right here. And I'm going to take that data. Zero gets determined by where that wheel is set when the power is on or when you connect to it. So you can say I'm just putting it a little ahead of that mark. Let's go ahead and stop the collection, find the peak. Is that selected instead of the hand? And we'll run the Gaussian fit which is 191 degrees. We'll put that in the table. This is 6%, or 6 out of 100 mils. And so that, in terms of grams per mil, is 100 times smaller, 0 0.06. And then we'll say the difference between 187 and 191 is 4 degrees. All right. And we'll go for the last one to get our curve. Let's run a 10% solution. Again, these are going to be very similar in process to many of the labs are going to ask you to do this. This doesn't have a mark on here with the, the manufacturers, so I made a little mark on there myself with a little red mark. 
So I can orient it the same way all the time. Make sure this is just a little ahead of where we started so it starts closer to the axis. See where we started and I'm gonna roll that through nice and even pace. If you go too fast, the, the peak may shift a little and not get caught by the um, best line of fit. So I usually just do it a nice even pace. All right, we'll choose our selection tool and we'll come down here and grab a nice symmetric amount of the curve. If you can't reach the top one, you can go to the bottom one, the tool in the toolbar, choose your Gaussian fit, and we'll get a nice reading of 193. Okay, this is a 10% solution or 10 grams per 100 mils, and that means it's point, uh, 0 0.1. The difference here is 6 degrees of rotation to get that to line up. And you'll see that my graph is growing. You may think, oh, that's all squinched together. What's nice is you can change the scale of this by pulling on the axes. That's one way you can, you know, get this to fill your screen. Or you can just use the tools on the bottom and then hit the arrows so that it zooms to your data. Notice it'll move the, the graph to so your data is, is showing up. Now, you may also say, hey, I want to know what the line is that fits through this because I want to sort of guess at some unknown solution, which I've made here. Um, and I want to find out what that concentration is. So what you're going to need to do is look at this legend here, and you've got to highlight the last run you made because that's the one that has all four of these data points in. So you're going to have to switch the run to run four, and then you can do the line fit through that, and it'll have this great line that'll say, here's the best fit through here. Now, like you do in Beer's Law, like a normal spectrometer, you'd use darker and darker color solutions, and that would then show absorbance gets you know, lower and lower, that you would instead use how the light vibration turns. So if it's like this, and then you say, oh, here's my unknown is somewhere in between, I can tell what that concentration is. So let's do that. There's the last of the standards. I'm going to put in an unknown, which your instructor may have made, and so they know the concentration. I'll put the, the brand up, move this to the right, make sure this is in a good spot. Let's go back to our original curve. And let's run this last one. Okay. Again, I'm going to use this second. It looks like the second wave, but it's really the first full wave. That's why we're using that one. Because if it shifts, you never know on those ones that are close. I don't use this one because it may shift to the left, and then you can't use it in the second or third run. But let's use that one to find out your unknown. I'm going to find the center of that distribution. We use the key down here, or you can use the one up top, again, right there. We'll use the Gaussian fit, and this is at 188. So where, when light turns to 188 peak, okay, that's right in here, 188. We want to know what the concentration is. So what's the shift from normal, from water? It is a one degree shift. So let's put that in, 1.0. That's the observed optical rotation. And if you come over here on the left side in your y-axis, one degree should make a solution a little less than 0 0.02, a little less than 2%, maybe 1.8, 1.7. And if you want to try a value, you can. Let's put in there 0 0.018 or something. Okay, and um, it's add uh, it actually it, it, the way I've set this up is going to have um, only a tenth is, is what I was possible to put in because I wasn't that careful when I weighed these. So I put the formatting to only go to the tenth, but it's saying it's somewhere between two tenths or a little less. I can see it's a little less than two tenths, but that's what you're going to do in all of these cases. Just by looking at them, you can tell how sweet it is based on the property of polar uh, polarized, plain polarized light. You can use that to determine several things, um, like how fast a reaction is going, how fast that concentration of sugar might be going away. You can determine how much sugar is in a natural solution that has sweetener in it, uh, like a sports drink or you know, a favorite drink that you'd have um, maybe at home, Kool-Aid or something that has sugar in it, um, or even a fruit juice. So as uh, long as you get the light through and you can see how much that rotation of the optical um, polarization of the light is, you'll be able to term determine how much of that 
polar molecule, that chiral molecule that you have, not polar, chiral molecule, is in that solution. So use these techniques and we're excited to uh, get you out using some of our labs, which you can find right on our website at pasco.com for the polarimeter. And we look forward to you having uh, some great instrumentation to determine some important scientific things you can't in other ways.